Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here on this day, uh, this very important day. Uh, we've worked really hard to put all of this together and uh, have many of our great colleagues who've been working with us for 20 plus years, and we appreciate you being here and supporting us. So my name is Carol Magruder, and I'm the chair of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. And I'm going to see if I can advance my slides. There we go. All right. So we were formed in 2008, um, largely in part um, in response to many of the cuts that we were experiencing in California with services to variety populations around tobacco control. And co coincidentally, in 2009, our president signed the Tobacco Control Act. And uh, we were thrust into the national arena because there was just such a lack of um, leadership in terms of anybody speaking for African Americans and other priority populations with regards to the regulation or the non-regulation of the flavor menthol and cigarettes. So that's what we're here today. Uh, we've been fighting since 2009 um, all over this country to get the FDA to do uh, what it was mandated to do quite a while ago, and there's research, so we have a wide array of presenters that are going to be talking to you about why we would like President Obama to instruct the FDA to finally to act um, before he leaves office and to help his people in particular and all of the children and the party populations of this, of this great United States of America. Um, I want to, um, this is actually the wrong, let's see, the wrong one. Okay, so we're going to leave it there. Uh, you, you're going to have to swap it. I will do that. But anyway, I'm going to bring up my co-chair, Dr. Philip Gar Gartner. We have um, our Congresswoman, Karen Bass, who was the first African-American speaker of the California State Assembly. I'm going to let him do the rest um, in introducing her. But we're so honored to have her here, and she's been a great supporter of our efforts. Thank you. Look, thank you, Carol. And um, look, thank you all for coming up. Um, I've known Carol a long Carol. I've known um, Karen a long time, and I'm not going to say how long. I thought about that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be cool, okay? Um, Karen Bass is the representative of the 37th um, Congressional District um, in California. She was Speaker of the California State Assembly. Um, she's a stalwart fighter for social justice and has been for a number of years. She is one of the few African-American elected officials who stood with us when AATCLC exposed the undercount of African-American smokers. My accolades could go on and on. She's a colleague. She's a friend. Only colleagues and friends who are elected officials would come out on a day like this. Um, I want to thank you and welcome to the stage um, Representative Bass. Thank you. <laughs> oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is definitely my pleasure to be here with you today, and, and I'm not shy in saying that we've known each other for like four decades, um, because it's been four decades of struggling for uh, social and economic justice, and to me, this issue is certainly representative of that. Uh, I want to congratulate you on the work that you've done, though, with the uh, Leadership Council. Uh, it's, it's strange you say, oh, eight. I actually thought it was much longer than that because this has been a fight for a very long time. Um, before uh, running for office, I was with an organization, a community coalition in South Central Los Angeles, and we actually had one of those tobacco control grants. And what we were focusing on in those years was the uh, disproportionate number of liquor stores that were in uh, inner city areas. And of course, with that came uh, tobacco as well as the sell of single cigarettes and uh, trying to fight that along with the tobacco advertising. So this has been a long fight and the industry always finds ways to recreate itself. And so now with the electronic cigarette, I've never understood that. Um, but, <laughs> you know, that's a whole new way now for the uh, industry to figure out ways to get, in particular, young people uh, addicted to tobacco. And so this particular issue of menthol and calling on President Obama to uh, do something about this before he leaves office, I am very proud to say I'm happy to do whatever it will take to, uh, to make that happen, to raise this to the level of uh, President Obama, uh, of his administration, and encourage him to um, 
correct this before he leaves office. Now, having said that, I know that there's an awful lot on his plate. Um, and so I think we continue the struggle with President Obama, but I also think that there will still be more for us to do when we welcome our next president. Um, oh, something is singing to me. There you go. Oh, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I just want to say to the leadership uh, council, whatever it is that you need to have done, if there is a letter that is circulated, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to do that, uh, to join with the council to do that. But I do think that we need a plan A and a plan B. And because I am confident that our country is not going to be subjected to that guy, uh, and that we can plan <laughs> for an, uh, a different type of administration, that we have a plan A and that we have a plan B. If we get President Obama to act, that will be great. I'm sure that there will still need to be work that needs to be done. Uh, if we don't, I think we continue it on to the next administration. But just know from me, I am happy to take the lead on whatever you guys need to have done, and uh, we'll make sure that that happens. So thank you very much. going to join us. I wasn't going to say for four decades. It's actually been even a lo little longer than that. But uh, <laughs> it's been a good four decades, and it's a good fight for social justice. Um, anyway, Carol, are you um, OK? All righty. So we have had many uh, technical difficulties over this past week. So it's been a week of grace for me and rolling with the punches. Um, so right now I'm going to introduce formally my co-chair, my brother, and we're like, we call ourselves the Three Musketeers. We really could not have done the work that we do along with our council in California if we didn't really enjoy each other's company and support each other. So Dr. Philip Gardner is a public health activist, administrator, evaluator, and researcher. He is currently uh, the behavioral and social. I asked him to update his, his uh bio because he's got a different role now, so I'm going to let him tell you about that. But he it has kept the issue of menthol al alive. He uh, convened the first, our first menthol conference in this country and the second one as well, and has written numerous uh, research articles that have been used to further our cause. So Dr. Gardner, and then we're going to advance the slides. There should be a slide that says Philip Gardner there. That'll advance his slides. The um, story that we're about to tell you um, today, um, many of you already know. Many of you on the um, many of you on the webcast know this story too. What we're trying to do, though, is actually involve the President of the United States in this discussion. Um, I appreciate um, um, Karen's remarks. I did have some slides, um, as I recall. We looked at them yesterday. Okay, um, but yeah, we're trying to evolve, and I appreciate Karen's remarks because this may not happen in the next two months. Indeed, we convened the first menthol conference in 2002. Um, we had the follow-up conference in 2009, um, and um, here we are today. Let me d say one other thing while we try and get the slides up and going. Um, let me just do a shout out to the dozens of organizations that signed on to the letter that we sent to the president um, and the hundreds of people. Actually, we have, we have hundreds of people, you know, my, as you guys, all email boxes are completely full. Mine is beyond full, and so is Carol's. There we go. Um, thank you, um, folks. So that, I just wanted to do a shout out to that. But the story I'm about to tell here is um, not one of the greatest stories. Um, and unfortunately, many of us already know about it. African Americans contract cancer more. The red line, that's the tallest, is men. The blue line next to it is women. And die disproportionately more. The red line, the tallest, is African American men. And even look at African American women dying more than most other men. We die disproportionately of cancer-related diseases. There's a period there. Okay. Um, when we break it down and actually look at lung cancer itself, 
African-American men. I know, I have it. <laughs> um, African-American men have literally twice the incidence of lung cancer, and they die disproportionately from it. These are figures from um, 2007. I could have showed you figures from 1997. I could have shown you figures from 1998. Even the figures today show the same thing. I'm going to suggest to you, as many of you know, but we want to drive this home to the um, Congress and to the President, that I'm going to suggest to you that part of what has taken place here, a good part of this, is the use of menthol cigarettes and what I call the African-Americanization of menthol cigarettes, or 50 years of predatory marketing. I'll go through this quickly. I know we have a lot of speakers. Um, let's just start here. Um, we sometimes want to put these slides in different order. Um, but I like this to be the take home. Um, in 1953, only 5% of African Americans used menthol products. By 68, it had nearly tripled. By 76, it had tripled again. By the mid 2000s, it's greater than 80%. Today, we know it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 85% of African American smokers smoke menthol cigarettes. Where did this come from? Why would, did this just happen naturally? Well, of course, it didn't happen naturally. I would suggest to you that the tobacco industry in the assault on the African-American community began to use male actors with um, African-American features in the early 1960s when Jim Crow still existed, when other groups were, were not hiring black people. The tobacco industry was not only hiring them, they were using them. They tripled cigarette advertising, particularly in ebony, but in all in black papers. They began to use our idiom, menthol's got a brand new bag, a la James Brown. There's the cool jazz, cool lexicon, cool cigarettes, cool jazz festival. You see a relationship there. And of course, the great paper written by my colleague, Dr. Valerie Yerger on philanthropy, smoking with the enemy. Unfortunately, the tobacco industry has given money to most, if not all, of um, African-American organizations, both religious, civil, political, um, and social organizations. That was in the 60s. This is an ad from 1970. I think they're aiming at a particular um, demographic. This is mid-1970s. Um, African Americans love a basketball, of course. After all, if you're going to smoke, it should be, be a pleasure. Why bother? Um, of course, I always play basketball in a suit and a tie. Um, <laughs> by the 80s, the menthol wars had erupted. Most of what you saw was Brown and Williamson, other folks caught on, and essentially the cigarette sampling van wars began, another great article by my colleague, Dr. Yerger. The fight broke out. There were um, vans traveling down the street, blaring music out, giving free samples away. They knew the street corners. They knew the places where people go, and they made it available to them. They even began to develop cigarettes specifically marketed to us, Uptown Cigarettes in 1989, which we were able to get kicked off the market. By the mid night, again, Newport Pleasure, but by the mid 90s, we had X brand cigarettes um, building off Malcolm X, this package in the red, black, and green um, liberation colors that we again got removed from the market. By 2004, we had the Cool Mix campaign. Um, where DJs converged on Chicago to uh, mix and match and, and to do this. We got this outlawed too. And then, of course, to add insult to injury, each of the, f the, the, um, the pictures you see in front of you are a separate pack of cigarettes um, aimed directly at our community. We're very clear that this has been predatory marketing straight up that has led to the disproportionate death of our, in our community. What do we mean by predatory marketing? In short, there's more advertising of menthol products in the African-American community. There are larger signage in the African-American community. There are more attractive promotions and special brands. I showed you some of the special brands. And menthol cigarettes, which pisses me off the most, is are cheaper in the African-American community. I'm sure Dr. Um, Henriksen and others will speak about that later in this um, conference. The ultimate candy flavoring, this is what menthol it is. It isn't that menthol kills you, it isn't this, that, and the other, it's that menthol helps the poison go down easier. It masks the harsh taste of smoking. It has a cooling and anesthetic effect, promoting deeper inhalation. 
It activates more brain nicotine receptors than if there wasn't nicotine in it, and it has been shown by other research that that tobacco smoke with menthol in it has greater cell permeability, being able to penetrate cells better if it didn't have menthol in it. The federal inaction is a sordid history, and I, I, I know I have short time, I'll do this quickly. The 2009 Family Smoking Tobacco Prevention Act banned the use of 13 flavors. The one they left out was menthol. The TIPS Act was then ordered to write a report, which they produced in 2011, but was not released by the Office on Management and Budget until 2013. The FDA con did their own study and came to the same conclusion that removing menthol products from the marketplace would be beneficial to the public health. Not to be outdone by the government, the tobacco industry intervenes and sues um, saying that the TIPSAC report could not be used because the people who produced it had ties to the pharmaceutical industry, thus again blocking the use of the report. We, when I say stirrings, the ruling was overturned last summer and thus allowing the FDA C, um, Center for Tobacco Products to use the report. I think it was actually a bold step on the part of the um, Food and Drug Administration's um, Center for Tobacco Products that actually included menthol and flavored cigarettes in the selling um, in the new deeming regulations that covered electronic cigarettes, hookah, cigars, cigarillos, and the like. That was a bold step for them. But of course, um, however, to add insult to seven years of inaction in industry, 16 pages, let me repeat, 16 pages of the new deeming regulations on e-cigarettes, cigars, and cigarillos and other products were redlined by the Office of Management and Budget that pertain to flavors and menthol, and thus again exempting menthol. You notice a pattern here for the last seven years. This is just one snake in the grass. I know the question has been asked, well, how do they do this? Are they doing this on purpose? Well, yeah, there are people in the Office on Management and Budget who support the tobacco industry. Great article in the New York Times just a few weeks ago, um, Andrew Perot, Perot um, White House Office on Information and Regulatory Affairs and the Office of Management and Budget. He supervised the FDA, U USDA policies regarding other things, tobacco. He was always trying to water these things down. When he left in 2014, he was hired by the, ci the cigar industry and Enjoy in 2014. He left that job nine months later and was rehired by the White House to serve on the Office on Management and Budget. It was precisely then that the deeming regulations came out in April of this year and they were redlined. So we even know what, what the deal is and who the deal is. I'm gonna suggest this to you. Um, menthol's been a sacrificial lamb, straight up, and that means the African American community in particular and young kids generally have been sacrificial lambs. This has gone far enough. I want to thank all of you for coming out here today, but the punchline here is that President Obama should order the FDA and the Center for Tobacco Products to initiate a new ruling that would remove menthol and flavored tobacco products from the marketplace, straight out. As a first step in this, we would call on addressing this situation, and President Obama should convene a meeting of the leaders of, um, from around the country in tobacco control, many of you in this room. Um, I want to again appreciate the comments my, my friend and colleague Karen Bassett says, even if Mr. Obama doesn't get to this, whoever is elected needs to get to this. Um, let's just be frank about this. If President Obama was to do this, it would literally save millions of lives. It would specifically save somewhere in the neighborhood 45 million black lives a year. This is not a minor ask. This is something that could do and have a huge um, public health impact. With that, I'm going to thank you. This is how you can reach me. Um, and if there's time for questions later, we can do that. Thank you very much. OK. Um, at, before we go on, we're going to bring up next uh, Dr. Lisa Henriksen from Stanford. But as Phil gave you the rundown of the act, but there are some people who we really want to thank thank who have contributed to this fight historically and we wouldn't be standing on this podium um, if it wasn't for them. So when the Tobacco Control Act, before it was signed, it came to the attention of, of, Afri of advocates and African Americans that, about menthol that all the flavors were gonna be um, taken out except for menthol. And so that created a buzz of activity uh, by people like Bill Robinson, 
uh, NAPTIN, the AATCLC, um, uh, the Honorable Donna Christensen, who, who led the Congressional Black Caucus to, to get an amendment about menthol, and that's what made the FDA have that at the top of their to-do list when they were created, when they were given the authority to do what we're asking them to do today. We also want to thank um, the great city of Chicago, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, um, the entire Department of Public Health of Chicago, Health Commissioner Bashara Shukair, Dr. Lopez, Kendall Stagg, Donna Scrutchins, and a brother, our brother who passed away this year, uh, brother Ronald Quasi Harris, who worked at Chicago State University with African American men there, and he integrated the issues of tobacco control and was one of the people who was responsible for this, the Chicago, the state of Illinois, actually getting the Cool Mix campaign taken off the market. Uh, we also want to thank there are people in Minnesota, Clearway, Minnesota, which William Mitchell College of Law. We want to thank our African American state legislator, Senator Jeff Hayden and Assemblymember Rena Moran, who were some of the first African-American legislators who took this issue on, who, who got funding for our people to see what's going on with menthol and what the state of Minnesota and Minneapolis-St. Paul are going to do about it. Um, a community act, act advocate, Latricia Vital. We want to thank our city councilwoman in Baltimore, Helen Holton, who introduced legislation for the buffer zone. And we want to particularly point out that the cities of Chicago and Baltimore have had some of the highest homicide rates um, on record, and yet their leaders were able to do what we have to do, which is we have to put tobacco control, which is the number one killer of black people, we have to put it at, at the top of our priority list about what actions we're going to take on it. We also want to thank Berkeley City Councilmen um, Daryl Moore and Max Anderson, who, who introduced the legislation in Berkeley, California, and it was passed, the buffer zone. So I will thank other people as we get going. Um, but I'm going to bring up now Dr. Lisa Henriksen, who's a researcher out of Stanford. She's a senior research scientist at the Stanford Prevention Research Center and a senior editor of the International Journal Tobacco Control. She is principal investigator of several federal and state projects about the retail environment for tobacco products and its contribution to socioeconomic and racial disparities that characterize tobacco use and tobacco-related disease. Lisa is also a principal investigator of advancing science and policy in the retail environment, ASPIRE, a study funded by the National Cancer Institute State and Community Tobacco Control Initiative. She chaired the work group that created the Standardized Tobacco Assessment for Retail Settings, STARS, an easy-to-use marketing surveillance instrument. Lisa received her PhD in communications from Stanford University. Before coming to SPRC, Lisa served on the faculty at the School of Communication, Information, and Library Studies at Rutgers University, where she earned the Sussman Award for Excellence in Teaching. Lisa, would you come on up? And we want to thank um, our sponsors who have helped with the scientific disse dissemination of, the, of our conference, Focus on Health. A tobacco related disease research program out of California and NAPTIN, of which we are a proud affiliate. Come on, Lisa. Thank you. Many thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak about research. Um, I'm going to talk primarily about the retail environment. The research that you're going to hear about is funded by California's Tobacco Related Disease Research Program and the National Cancer Institute, and I want to remind you that. Uh, the opinions and conclusions that I draw are mine and not statements of these agencies. I'm going to use five minutes to make three very quick points about the retail environment for flavored tobacco, about disparities in advertising and price that echo some of the points that Dr. Gardner made and the impact of these kinds of messages on smoking initiation. Um, I speak about the retail environment because it <laughs> um, receives such a vast spending from the tobacco industry on marketing $8.6 billion in 2013, spent on pr uh, product placement, price promotions, and advertising like those in the left corner of this image that persuade youth and other customers to find your flavor, and that's easy to do, whoopsies. <laughs> Uh, in an environment that's saturated with tobacco retailers, our research estimates there are 375,000 stores that sell tobacco in the United States. That's 28 times as many tobacco retailers as McDonald's and almost as many as there are automatic teller machines. 
uh, uh, flavored tobacco is available practically everywhere that tobacco is sold. And this graph illustrates that 98% of those 375,000 stores sell menthol cigarettes. 85% of them sell uh, flavored little cigars and cigarillos that are so popular with youth and uh, generally in African American youth particularly. Uh, last week in Preventive Medicine, uh, they published our research from a nationally representative sample of U.S. households with teenagers ages 13 to 16. We knew about their home address and where they went to school and learned that about 40% of them uh, attend school within at least 1,000 feet of one tobacco retailer and 41% live within walking distance of a tobacco retailer. But what re is really important is how different this environment is for African American youth who are two times more likely to live near a tobacco retailer and that's regardless of their household income. In, in the United States. Thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, the second point is that how different that retail environment looks in African American neighborhoods where menthol cigarettes are advertised more and cost less. And here are some examples. Uh, research by Dr. Yerger and many other scholar, scholars has highlighted uh, the tobacco industry documents uh, like this one from, the from 1977, which explains how retail marketing is informed by neighborhood geography. But my point in showing old documents is to <laughs> indicate that this pattern is still very present in our current environment. Uh, in California, we visited stores uh, within walking distance of a random sample of California high schools. We measured the proportion of cigarette ads that advertise menthol, something that marketers call the share of voice. And the point of this slide is to illustrate for you that as the percent of African American students at the nearby school increase, the share of voice for menthol gets louder and louder and the price gets cheaper and cheaper, 12 cents less a pack for each unit increase in the percent of African American students nearby. This pattern was unique to Newport, not evident for the other brands that we studied. It's not unique to California and it's not unique to stores near schools. In a representative sample of retailers in the United States, in neighborhoods with a larger proportion of African American residents, stores were more likely to sell flavored cigarettes, more likely to advertise tobacco on store windows and outside, and more likely to offer discounts on Newport menthol. These disparities persist in new studies uh, recently published in the American Journal of Public Health. Uh, we looked at two representative samples, large ones in the state of California and in the entire US. Again, Newport costs less uh, with each percentage increase in the proportion of African Americans in the um, neighborhood around the store. The, all of these models adjust for the type of store in the neighborhood and for neighborhood income and for population density. This pattern is peculiar to race and often unique to Newport. Uh, this kind of marketing matters, and this is my last point about uh, the potential impact on smoking initiation. Uh, in an older study uh, in Vallejo, California, we surveyed uh, youth who were sixth to eighth graders uh, when we first surveyed them, and then we followed them up after 12 months. Uh, this graph illustrates um, the results of a quiz where we take away the brand name and ask students what, what brand is advertised. African Americans were students were significantly more likely than other peers to recognize the Newport brand, significantly less likely to advertise, uh, to recognize the Marlboro brand. And my point is that uh, when we come back a year later uh, to, to survey those who had never tried smoking when we first asked those questions, 17% uh, of students had started smoking uh, in the intervening 12 months. And those who were uh, most likely to do that were those who, students who recognized that Newport brand. So it, it does matter, and the pattern, again, was unique to Newport, uh, not, not relevant to the other advertisements we asked about. Concern about this kind of target marketing has made uh, an impression on state and community tobacco control and the instrument that Dr. Magruder uh, mentioned about uh, STARS, the only brand specific price that's on that instrument is the price of Newport menthol. So that state and lo uh, local tobacco control programs can look at disparities in their own uh, neighborhoods. But 
uh, my guess is that this is a foregone conclusion. And it's unusual for an academic to stand at a podium and say more research is not needed. But more research is not needed. <laughs> African American youth are exposed to more menthol marketing, to lower prices for the most popular brand. The impact of price and marketing on youth is well established, reported in the US Surgeon General's report in systematic reviews of studies of, menthol, of uh, tobacco marketing generally and its impact on youth smoking specifically. And such a strong evidence base warrants policy change now. Thank you. Oh, am I going forward? Okay. Next up, you're in for a treat. Um, we have the formidable Sharon Eubanks, who is our tireless warrior. Um, I want to give a plug for her book. <laughs> that she co-wrote with uh, Dr. Stan Glantz out at UCSF Bad Acts. And so this book documents uh, what she's going to be talking with you about in a few minutes. So prior to join, joining uh, Borders and Borders, a West Virginia firm, Sharon Eubanks co-founded the Washington, D.C. public-based interest law firm, Edwards and Eubanks. From 2000 to 2005, Sharon served as lead counsel on behalf of the United States in the largest civil Racketeer Influence and Corruption Organizations, RICO, enforcement action ever filed, the United States versus Philip Morris USA et al., the federal tobacco litigation. Sharon is co-author of Bad Acts, the racketeering case against the tobacco industry, an insider's account of the federal tobacco litigation that led to the land, that landmark decision. Sharon has taught trial advocacy at George Washington University School of Law as an adjunct professor and has served as an instructor for the National Institute for Trial Advocacy. She is a member of the advisory committee for the Center for Tobacco Control Research and Education at the University of California, San Francisco, and serves as a board uh, member and officer for Americans for Non-Smokers Rights. So let's bring Sharon up. Good morning, everybody. It was almost 17 years ago that the U.S. Justice Department filed a civil racketeering action against the major cigarette manufacturers uh, operating in the United States at that time, which was 1999. Now let's talk about what happened after that. In 2006, after years of discovery, pretrial litigation, and a nine-month bench trial, the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, Judge Gladys Kessler, issued an opinion containing over 4,000 findings of fact and concluding that the government had proven by overwhelming evidence, her words, not mine, that the defendants had maintained an illegal racketeering enterprise in violation of RICO, the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. In other words, they were racketeers. They were gangsters. Now, that opinion was handed down over 10 years ago, most of it being affirmed by the appellate court, all of the findings of fact being affirmed by the, federal, uh, by the uh, appellate court. Even so, we are still waiting. We are waiting for the implementation of remedies in that case that could help a variety of populations. Um, the court's factual findings in this case uh, established with clarity the role of cigarette companies in addicting youth and in addicting African Americans in particular. As those findings of fact and those that were, all of those as I noted before were sustained on appeal, those findings of facts, fact unequivocally establish that the industry knew that menthol smokers are disproportionately black and disproportionately young. Not surprisingly, they studied these behaviors, they targeted these groups in their marketing efforts. Those are facts, it happened. Uh, efforts at trial to seek more meaningful remedies uh, were derailed. In what can only be described as a political move, uh, the existing administration intervened to ensure that the remedies that we sought when we filed the case under the Clinton administration were not uh, proceeded with. Um, there was a disagreement. It was political. I don't think they believed that we were going to win, and they intervened, and at the time it was when it came time to argue for the remedies in the case, we were cut off at the knees. But we still have the facts, right? 
the facts do not go away. Those have been established by a court of law and an impartial judge has made these determinations. Now, what happened um, at the end of the trial that was quite remarkable was that was when I think I first began learning about this broad community of individuals who are tobacco control advocates and was invited into that. I was just a lawyer pursuing the case, but it, I would be remiss if I failed to mention that we had interveners who came in at that moment when the political interference occurred uh, to work with the court to, to be able to push forward for some of the remedies that um, we, the government, were leaving on the table. Uh, those organizations, or some of those organizations are here today, Americans for Nonsmokers' Rights, um, National African American Prevention Network, Tobacco Free Kids Action Fund. There also were the, the American Cancer Society, American Heart Association, and American Lung Association. My point is that this has been a really long battle. We have gone in every route that you can imagine. We've gone the legal route. Uh, we know that whatever that we do in this, in this regard will be challenged by the industry. So it makes no sense if you, you know, are paralyzed by indecision of which way to go, what to do. As Congresswoman Bass said, yes, have a plan A and have, have a plan B, but be fearless in that. We cannot continue to say, oh, uh, I'm in a fork in the road, take it, okay? I mean, seriously, uh, if, whatever you do is going to be challenged and, and build a record. But in that we are still waiting for uh, final remedies in a case that I concluded the trial in 2006 on, is that's, that's hard to, to accept. Um, but the hard work has already been done. The FDA now has some authority to regulate cigarettes, and our ask is straightforward here. It's well supported by the evidence, and here it is. Let me just be clear. Please direct the FDA, Mr. President, to issue a proposed rule to remove all flavored tobacco products, including mentholated cigarettes, from the marketplace. The FDA has done its part. It has collected and analyzed the evidence related to flavored products, and it's time, respectfully, Mr. President, uh, for, for you to do your part. Lives will be saved. There's another way to do this. He could direct the FDA, but also there's something that we've heard a lot about this year, and I think there was even a Supreme Court case dealing with the power to issue an executive order. This president, our President Obama, has issued 235 executive orders so far this year. He could, he could issue an executive order requiring um, the FDA to move forward with its, with its position. Um, it, it's disturbing that the slides that we saw that Dr. Gardner put up about the interference and, and you know, the, the ethical issues raised by um, you know, going out the back door and coming in the front, back in and out of government. Uh, these are things that I think we can also, and I'm happy to talk offline with some people about some ideas I have. I hadn't known as much until I came here and heard from Dr. Gardner about what can be do that, done there. But we have to continue to press forward on these issues and, and make the president understand that in 2009, when he sm signed the Smoking Prevention Act, that was not all that he could do. He can do much more. Um, thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you, Sharon. And I, I want to add in that um, when you go against the tobacco industry in this town, we're in Washington, D.C., that it's at great uh, personal sacrifice and that we appreciate the sacrifice that you made to your professional career in taking on this case and challenging it and keeping in the fight with us. We appreciate your sacrifice. Okay, our next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Valerie Yerger, who is my sister colleague, I call her. Uh, she is a naturopath, a licensed naturopathic doctor and an associate professor in health policy at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Yerger's ar archival research of previously secret tobacco documents has uncovered the tobacco industry's relationship building with the African American leadership groups, marketing of menthol cigarettes in inner city communities, and the accumulation of nicotine in tissues containing melanin. 
She has provided expert testimony to the FDA and its Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee on tobacco companies' in-house research on menthol as an additive to cigarettes. Dr. Yerger is a past recipient of the Truth Initiative Civil G. Jacobs Award for Outstanding Use of Tobacco Industry Documents and is a former health disparity scholar of the National Institutes of Health. And I want to say that um, I use Dr. Yerger's research in my work every day. Um, her paper, Smoking with the Enemy, which I think she's going to talk about, is something that's been very powerful and has actually helped to change um, the environment that she found when she um, discovered those documents, she and Dr. Ruth Malone. So come on up, Valerie. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. This is truly exciting. You know, when you can have a researcher who's able to have a partnership with community advocates and folks who are working at the grassroots level um, to take your research and use it as ammunition for their work, it's very, very exciting. And I hope is a model for many of our other researchers out there who have the evidence that makes us um, very, very powerful in our work. So yes, I'm one of the original tobacco documents researchers um, from the University of California at San Francisco. I owe a lot to my colleagues, Ruth Malone and Stan Glantz. Um, you know, I, I gave up my clinical practice to follow the trail of these documents. Once I first started looking, there was no way that I could turn my back on what I was saying, um, we now house million, millions of these documents um, on our UC San Francisco's tobacco documents um, library. So we've talked already enough about the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, um, which was passed in Congress and signed by President Obama in 2009, granting the US Food and Drug Administration, the authority to regulate tobacco products. The Tobacco Control Act prohibits tobacco manufacturers from including any of the candy-like fruity flavors in cigarettes. But the FDA also has the authority to extend this, um, their authority to include menthol. But as of today, the FDA has yet to, to do so. Nor has the FDA, through its recent deeming rule, applied its authority to extend a flavor ban to all the other emerging tobacco products that we're seeing, like the little cigars, cigarillos, hookah, and of course, um, electronic cigarettes. Um, many tobacco control advocates and public health professionals see this protected status of these flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes, as a social justice issue with serious racist undertones. So according to the FDA's Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee, by not removing menthol from cigarettes when the FDA was first given the authority to do so, will result in approximately half a million African American children starting smoking by the year 2020. People, that's just three years from now. That's a lot. That breaks my heart. I'm a mother of four, grandmother of two, breaks my heart. The continued availability of menthol cigarettes in the marketplace has prompted a number of advocacy and legislative efforts directed toward prohibiting the use of these flavors and tobacco products or restricting their sales. And so I just want to share with you, because when we got to a crossroads, when nothing's happening with the FDA, do we continue? Yeah, we continue, but what else can we do? And thank goodness we have partners who are giving us some ideas, so we decided that we wanted to pursue some of these ideas. So I just wanted to share with you some of the actions that have been taken um, to try to get menthol cigarettes and other flavored tobacco products off the marketplace. Back in August 2011, the um, Congressional Asian Pacific American um, Caucus wrote a letter and I'll share with you that Congresswomen um, Barbara Lee and Judy Chu wrote the FDA Commissioner, Margaret Hamburg at the time, calling for the removal of menthol from the marketplace. In April 2013, there was a formal citizen petition that was filed by 20 leading national public health organizations urging the FDA to 
um, remove menthol as a characterizing flavor in cigarettes. In November 2013, there were 27 state attorneys general who wrote a letter that was submitted to the FDA calling for an outright ban on the use of menthol in cigarettes. In December 2013, we heard already about Chicago, Illinois, being the first local um, jurisdiction to create a buffer zone around schools. 2015, in September, Berkeley, California, implemented a 600-foot buffer zone. And in June and November of last year, Minneapolis and St. Paul um, also are restricting cells. Um, they're right now looking at what they can do specifically with menthol cigarettes, but at least they've taken the steps toward um, restrict, restricting the cells of flavored tobacco products. Other jurisdictions um, include many in California, Contra Costa County, Hayward, San Francisco, Sonoma County, um, have either taken action or considering some sort of action. So we see a trend here and what can be done locally. So we know it is not by mere accident or coincidence that the tobacco industry and its mentholated products have a stranglehold on African American communities across our nation. It is by corporate design. We have evidence from the tobacco documents, um, such as this one, just as an example, um, showing where for decades tobacco companies targeted U.S. center cities with highly concentrated culturally friendly menthol marketing. In essence, these urban communities became the battlefield for the menthol wars where tobacco companies aggressively competed against one another. This confidential memo reveals Lorillard Tobacco Company directed its field representatives to stay out of the suburbs and go directly into tough inner city neighborhoods, and that's a quote to promote its mentholated Newport cigarettes and noted that the competition is centering their marketing efforts in the low-income black communities. So many black leadership groups have widespread presence through their complex social and professional networks. So one of the other ways that we can have some influence is through resolutions. And now resolutions can stimulate change by educating and engaging memberships in policymaking and advocacy at local, state, and federal levels. Resolutions, while informing the development of meaningful policies, can provide specific guidelines for actions to decrease health and other social economic inequities. So I'm going to end my talk by talking about um, a few resolutions that have come about. In July of 2013, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, which is the largest African-American sorority, adopted a ban, um, um, adopted a resolution supporting a ban on menthol cigarettes. And this menthol resolution was adopted at the sorority's 51st National Convention, which was held here in Washington, D.C. There were 40,000 members present at this convention, and there was not a single objection to this resolution. In January of this year, the Bay Area Black Nurses Association has adopted a resolution calling on the FDA to ban menthol, but also requesting state and local governments to restrict sales of menthol cigarettes and other flavored tobacco products. And we were very excited to share with you that um, just a couple of months ago in Cincinnati, Ohio, at the National Convention of the NAACP, they as a national body also adopted a resolution calling on local chapters to support state and local efforts to regulate menthol cigarettes and other flavored tobacco products. And I think I just really want to say a quick word about this because these resolutions are um, a direct result of just a few people, myself included, um, and Carol Magruder. As a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, I introduced this resolution to my local chapter. I got buy-in from the local chapter. We got buy-in at the regional level, and we submitted this at the national convention, and so now we have national buy-in. Carol Magruder took on the NAACP a number of years ago. Um, 
becoming um, a president of the Berkeley chapter. I joined her with her work by um, chairing the health committee. We started to try to get a resolution passed with the NAACP for a number of years. It's probably been about seven years. And we were successful this past year. But it took years of work um, educating and getting people on board because, as you know, there are other interests that are there. And sometimes it just takes a while and perseverance to get people to see the truth and then to get them to see that they can move with the truth um, without necessarily um, losing all that they've been developing within their professional lives for decades. Um, so black organizations, we feel, are starting to show some interest in coming on board. And black legislators that we know are beginning to do things like give away or return donations that were given to them by the tobacco industry. Uh, we've seen black leaders go from being a front for the tobacco industry um, to supporting tobacco control policies and increasing the price of tobacco products. And we're watching our young people take ownership of protecting their community from the tobacco industry. We're some incredible videos that are out there that are being done. A lot of the work is being supported by Truth Initiative. Um, this is very exciting for us. Um, you know, I, I have four kids and I'm very proud of my children and people say to me, your kids are just so impressive. <coughs> That's what they see. What they don't see is all the blood, sweat, and tears that go into creating these incredible people for years. And it's the same thing with the work that we're doing. Like, we're really at an exciting point, but we've been working really hard. And just like seeds that are nurtured underground, we've been nurturing those seeds, and now it's starting to, to show up. And that's when we get more excitement and more momentum building. So this is a very, very exciting time for us. So as a licensed naturopathic doctor, I'm all about health and wellness. Um, but the moment I started researching the tobacco industry documents, I knew that there was a serious problem and that there could be no such thing as wellness for my community unless we got rid of tobacco. I've lost my mother. I've lost my grandmother to tobacco. I'm watching my brother and my uncle who are fighting for their lives. Um, because of their tobacco-related illnesses. So this isn't just a job or profession for me. Um, I've made a commitment to not stay silent. So thank you. Thank you, Valerie. And um, it is a personal mission for most of us who are participating in this press conference today. It's not just a job, it's something, um, our, a, a vocation for us that we are compelled to keep going on no matter what. Um, the next person that I want to bring up is Cynthia Hallett. And Cynthia Hallett is also a longtime uh, friend and collaborator with us uh, for the greater good. She is the president and CEO of the Americans for Non-Smokers Rights, ANR, and the ANR Foundation where she's worked since 1997. Cynthia's career in tobacco control began in 1989 at the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services Tobacco Control Program. Over the last 27 years, she has spearheaded successful smoke-free air campaigns, tracked and exposed tobacco industry interference, served as a media spokesperson and key note, keynote lecturer, as well as provided technical assistance training and strategic guidance on smoke-free workplaces, including restaurants, bars, and casinos tobacco-free college campuses and electronic cigarette and marijuana-free environments across the U.S. and internationally. Cynthia's early training was in cancer control and prevention, and she has worked at the National Cancer Institute and the UCLA Comprehensive Cancer Center. She received her Bachelor of Arts and Master of Public Health degrees from the University of California, Los Angeles. Please welcome her to the stage. And while she's coming, uh, a and has really done a lot of work around smoke-free homes, and African-American children have the highest rates of exposure in their homes with their family members smoking around them. And so this is another side of that problem that contributes to asthma, that contributes to sudden infant death syndrome. I hope I'm not stealing your comments. But uh, a and has been doing a lot of work in our communities around that, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Carol and Phil and Valerie, and to everyone with the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. As Carol said, I'm the president and CEO of Americans for Non-Smokers Rights. We are a nonprofit uh, public health advocacy group based in Berkeley, California. 
And we've been working for the last 40 years to protect everyone's right to breathe smoke-free air, and we track tobacco industry interference to sound public health measures such as smoke-free workplace laws, tobacco excise taxes, and the regulation of sales um, and the placement of tobacco products. Despite the great amount of progress that the non-smokers' rights movement and we have collectively made over the last four decades uh, with respect to smoke-free protections and other tobacco control measures, vulnerable populations, particularly communities of color, continue to be disproportionately exposed to secondhand smoke and also face massive target marketing by the tobacco companies. And as a result, these communities have higher rates of smoking and more tobacco-related illnesses. This is undeniably a social justice issue. And I'm here today to express Americans for Non-Smokers' Rights support of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council's call to action to remove menthol from all tobacco products. As we've heard this morning, tobacco companies have been waging their insidious and targeted campaigns to addict young people, as well as those in communities of colors, to its deadly product for decades. The targeting of the African American community to smoke mentholated cigarettes continues to have dire consequences on individual level health as well as population based public health. Menthol does not belong in tobacco products. It's outrageous and insulting that all other flavors were eliminated from tobacco, but not menthol. Tobacco consumption and exposure to secondhand smoke are critical drivers of health inequities. As ANR celebrates its 40th anniversary and looks to the future, we remain committed to working with our community and legislative partners to close gaps in protections and to promote health equity for all. I dedicate my remarks this morning in memory of a wonderful, sweet gentleman that I met as we were working on the Smoke Free New Orleans campaign. Mr. Mervyn Lewis was a New Orleans resident, native, uh, he was a critical voice in that campaign for smoke-free New Orleans, and he spoke about how much he loved his job in the casino, but the, and how the secondhand smoke was not merely a nuisance, but likely the cause of his lung cancer. He passed away on Sunday. He and other real people are the reason that I and everyone at Americans for Non-Smokers Rights continues this work so that we can advocate for everyone's right to be protected from exposure to secondhand smoke and to not be targeted by an industry that merely looks at us as dollar signs. It's about their profits and they're putting their profits over public health. And I'm committed to working on this issue. I think it's high time that we all work together on these significant public health issues and let us today all call upon President Obama and our other partners to remove menthol from all tobacco products to prevent any more unnecessary loss of life from smoking or secondhand smoke exposure. Thank you. We are really proud today to have two uh, representatives from our National Foundations on Tobacco Control. I'm gonna bring the first one up. His name is Dennis Hennigan and he is Director Legal and Policy Analysis at the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. He focuses on issues involving FDA regulation of the tobacco industry, as well as providing legal guidance on federal, state, and local tobacco control legislation. Prior to joining the campaign in September of 2012, he worked for over two decades at the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence, first as director of the center's legal action project, and then as the center's vice president. Before his tenure at the Brady Center, Denny was a partner in the law firm Foley and Lardner. Come on up, Mr. Uh, Denny. Denny. Looks good up there. Uh, thank you so much, Carol. Uh, on behalf of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, I want to express my appreciation for the opportunity to be here today and to join the powerful chorus of voices calling on FDA and the Obama administration to prohibit the sale of menthol cigarettes along with all flavored tobacco products. You know, on any public policy issue, there's a time for in investigation, there's a time for deliberation, and there's a time for action. On the issue of menthol cigarettes, the time for action has come. Over five years ago, in 2011, an advisory committee 
of independent scientists concluded that the availability of menthol cigarettes has led to an increase in the number of smokers and that therefore removal of menthol cigarettes from the marketplace would benefit the public health. The committee made the startling projection that by the year 2020, about 17,000 premature deaths will occur and about 2.3 million people will have started smoking beyond what would have occurred absent menthol cigarettes. And you heard earlier, that includes 500,000 black children. In 2013, FDA's staff scientists did their own evaluation of menthol, and they released a 153-page report that reinforced the conclusions of the advisory committee that menthol leads to increased initiation of smoking by youth and young adults, and it leads to greater addiction and makes it more difficult to quit smoking. And then, as you've heard, in May of this year, when FDA issued its rule extending its authority to other tobacco products, including e-cigarettes and cigars, the final rule it sent to the Office of Management and Budget for its review would have required flavored e-cigarettes and cigars put on the market after 2007 to be taken off the market, including menthol products. Now, OMB did block FDA from taking flavored tobacco products off the market and, as Dr. Gardner described, deleted, literally redlined, the entire section of the final rule, 16 pages, presenting the scientific case against flavored tobacco products. But OMB cannot delete the science supporting strong action to protect our kids from menthol and other flavored products. So on menthol, there's no need for further investigation. There's no need for further deliberation. FDA and the Obama administration know the right thing to do. The time for action on menthol has come. Thank you. Next up, we're going to bring up uh, Robin Koval, who leads the Truth Initiative. And we actually were interviewed in California by uh, Lincoln Mundy, who's doing a documentary on menthol and African Americans. And he was talking to us. And we met him one Sunday. And so this is, this is a hard issue. And when you talk about the, how the deep tentacles of the tobacco industry in every aspect of our lives, um, the first thing that we have to do is to tell the truth. And then we have to face the truth, and then we have to take action. And so when you tell the truth, it, it, there's only one way that you can go, really. There's only one path. You know, there, we're, at a pat, we're at a fork in the road, but there's really only one path because we know what tobacco is doing and what it will continue to do and how it continues to just morph. And we're trying to uh, continually play catch up with pieces of grant funding here and there, and they have billions of dollars of profit, and they simply morph and go, you know, go. At, they flow as water. So we want to bring up uh, Robin Koval, who leads the Truth Initiative. It's the nation's largest public health organization dedicated to achieving a culture where all youth and young adults reject tobacco. As CEO and President, Koval reimagined the evidence-based, life-saving truth youth tobacco prevention campaign, adapting the iconic brand for today's generation of digital natives and the changing tobacco control landscape. Before joining Truth Initiative, Robin co-founded and led the 700-person advertising agency, publicist Kaplan Thaler. Let's bring Robin up. Good morning, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, thank you to the AATCLC for hosting this, this wonderful event. Um, and I'm so proud to be here to represent Truth Initiative, our, our work on the Truth Campaign, and all the other programs that we have to achieve a culture where all youth and young adults reject tobacco. Uh, you know, as my colleagues have so, uh, I think, shockingly and persuasively said this morning, Menthol cigarettes are just a grave threat to our nation's public health and the accomplishment, certainly, of our mission 
And it's a national tragedy when you consider the overwhelming evidence against menthol combined with the terrible inequities, its toll on African American communities and vulnerable populations, uh, especially youth. And that's what I want to spend a moment talking about today. Uh, menthol cigarettes are known to reduce the harshness of cigarette smoke, uh, making them just about the perfect starter product for new smokers. And perhaps that's why 56% of teen smokers use menthol. As Phil said before, um, it is literally the spoonful of flavor that helps the poison go down. Um, young people don't know that every time they puff on a menthol cigarette, it puts them on a more direct path to becoming regular smokers. And worse, we know that when they do try to quit, if they try to quit, smoking menthol cigarettes makes it even more difficult to do so. Uh, young people don't know these facts, but the tobacco industry has known them for decades, right? We've seen that. And with the uh, combined evidence presented by numerous scientific experts, including the FDA's own panel, our government knows it too. Um, the continued pass and exemptions given to menthol tobacco and other flavors are really one of the greatest barriers to ending this epidemic. And it's true, menthol cigarettes are slowing our progress in tobacco control. We've seen tremendous declines in tobacco use prevalence among adults, among youth uh, in the past decade, and we all should feel very proud about that. Uh, but when we look at the data for menthol, a very disturbing trend is revealed. I want to share a chart with you. You have that? Oh, do I have to click? Yes. Sorry. That's OK. So yes, there's your slide. Ah, okay. thank you. There. You there. Uh, I want to share this chart with you. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, this is for data uh, for um, 2004 through 2010. And as you can see, non-menthol cigarette use declined in all age groups for teens and for young adults from 2004 to 2010. But now let's separate it. When you look at non-menthol cigarette use among adolescents, these are 12 to 17-year-olds, um, that declined from 6% in 2004 to 3.4% in 2010. That's a 43% decline. When you look at menthol cigarettes, so the green line, uh, during that period lagged way behind. Adolescent menthol tobacco use went from 5.3% in 2004 to 4.5% in 2010. That's only a 13% decline. And the, and the news gets worse. If you look at young adults, between the ages of 18 to 25, non-menthol cigarette smoking was 25.7% in 2004, went down to 17.3% in 2010, that's a 32% decline. But use of menthol cigarettes actually increased among young adults over this period. 14% of young adults smoked menthol cigarettes in 2004, compared to 16.3% in 2010. That's going in the wrong direction. Um, we can only conclude based on these data, six years of data, and even more recent studies, that menthol is undermining our momentum to end tobacco use. And yet action by our federal government, which you've heard much about today, um, has been as elusive, as I like to say, as a wisp of menthol smoke. Uh, but let me go uh, back to the original. Oh, that's me. Sorry. Which one was it? This one? Yes. Just ah, go. There we go. Okay. Uh, but thankfully, today's generation of young people uh, refuses to wait uh, for others to act. And, and my organization, Truth Initiative, understands their impatience. Since 2014, we've been empowering young people and funding programs to protect the lives of college students, faculty, and staff at academic institutions across America. And our focus is on the 105 federally recognized historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, and two-year community colleges that often are the gateway to post-secondary education for first-generation college students, people of color, uh, and low-income families, the very groups more likely to smoke, more likely to use menthol, uh, and to suffer disproportionately from tobacco. We're helping schools like Howard University, uh, right here in the nation's capital, to establish smoke-free campuses uh, with policies and with funding, seed funding, education, and training. And I'm very happy to tell you the change is happening. 
We've partnered and provided funding to 115 colleges to date in 35 states. We're reaching close to 1 million students and 100,000 campus employees, and already 35% of our grantees have passed policies to eliminate tobacco use on campus. It's an amazing, amazing achievement. We're making big impact on college campuses, but it's not enough. Right? We need the administration to do more to combat the dangers of menthol cigarettes. We can, we must, change this direction to make a life-saving difference, or as we say at Truth Initiative, to finish it. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. All right, next up is Rod Liu. He is my brother from California uh, and has worked with me. We've worked together for years, these past several decades. Uh, Rod is the founder and executive director of Asian Pacific Partners for Empowerment, Advocacy, and Leadership, Appeal, a national nonprofit organization created in 1994 to address health justice issues for Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Rod has over 28 years of experience in managing diverse community health programs and leading efforts towards the elimination of health disparities. His experience includes leadership development, program impl implementation, advocacy, coalition building, community-based research, strategic planning, grants development, and multimedia materials development. Rod was a contributing author to the 1998 Surgeon General's Report on Tobacco Use and has written and published widely on tobacco and health disparities. Rod provided testimony to the U.S. Congressional Committee on Commerce on the Impact of National Tobacco Policy and to the U.S. Surgeon General. He has also served on numerous national health advisory committees. And so we're going to have several members from our other priority populations. And that uh, just as smoking doesn't know how to stay in the smoking section, it doesn't know how to stay in one community. And often our communities live in the same communities. And there's definitely an influence one on the other. And that so we have uh, been working with them and been proud to do so over all these years for the commonalities and how the tobacco industry targets all of our communities and that we need to work together to find the solutions. Come on up, Rod. Thank you, Carol. Uh, thank you also, Valerie and uh, Dr. Phil. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here, and I think, first of all, I just wanted to recognize the African American Tobacco Leadership Council for their leadership over the past decade plus in making menthol an issue that needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed now. So can we just acknowledge the great work that they've done? As Carol mentioned, uh, I'm with Appeal, Asian Pacific Partners for Empowerment, Advocacy, and Leadership. We are a national health justice organization of over 800 organizations across the U.S. and the Pacific. And we are dedicated to addressing many different health equity issues. Um, we, as an organization, stand in solidarity with the African American community and other priority populations on this very important issue. Clearly, the science shows the great impact. And the speakers here this morning have articulated very nicely the importance of addressing menthol now. Menthol is a pipeline to destruction in our communities. We know the great impact that menthol has on the African American community. We also feel it's important to recognize that menthol has impact on other party populations, including Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. For those who are not familiar, Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders is a representative of more than 50 distinct ethnic and language groups. We're also one of the fastest growing groups in the United States. And when you look at some of the data and you disaggregate, you can see that for Native Hawaiians Pacific Islanders, those who smoke, more than half use menthol. And even for Asian Americans, when you look at some of the data, a third of Asian American smokers use menthol. So clearly, it's an important issue. But even more important has been shared about youth. More than half of Asian American youth use menthol, and that is something that we cannot accept. So we call upon the FDA 
to remove tobacco products, we ask respectfully President Obama to recognize also his Asian heritage and his Hawaiian heritage to see the impact on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. This is something that needs to happen now. It's something that is well past um, due. Um, we've asked the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, KPAC, back in 2011 to send a letter to the FDA to ask them to remove uh, menthol for five, six years ago. And that is something that we feel is still important for us to be able to continue. And we ask for the support of all of our communities of colors, all of our party populations around menthol, be able to give resources, to be able to educate, to be able to help to make some impact on policy change, and to really be able to achieve health equity. Health equity is more than just the vision of equal health for all communities. It takes hard work, it takes difficult decisions, and it takes working together to create the policies that will make that system happen. It just doesn't happen by itself. Menthol is a social justice issue for the African American community. It's a social justice issue for other communities of color, including Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. We ask for action now. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Rod. Next up, we're gonna have um, my sister, <laughs> Jeanette Notanius, who's trying to retire, but we won't let her. <laughs> oh. Dr. Jeanette Notanius is, a recognized is recognized nationally as a leader in the field of Latino and minority health and an expert in tobacco and alcohol policy issues. She is also known internationally for her work with the Pan American Health Organization on health planning, human resources, environmental health, and HIV AIDS. An immigrant from El Salvador, she obtained a Master's of Arts degree in Counseling Psychology from Antioch College and then a master's in economics and a, doctoral, a doctorate in social sciences from the Université de Paris, Sorbonne, in France. Dr. Notanius has worked in Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, Haiti, Guyana, and France. She speaks English, Spanish, and French. Dr. Notanius is currently the national director of the National Latino Alliance for Health Equity, a national network of 4,500 members addressing local, state, and national public health policy and program issues. And I wanna tell a little story before she comes up. Um, the last time we were in this building together, we were participating in a press conference um, hosted by the Honorable Joseph Califano and Dr. Lewis Sullivan. And after we left, we were going to lunch, and there's a shoe store down the street. And Jeanette was telling us the story of how there was an African American when she first moved to DC. Black people could not go into that store and that she had went in and tried the shoes on for the woman because the woman told her that they had the same size feet. So, and she has worked in our communities in the South. And uh, so she's a young woman here. So that happened just up the street here um, a few decades ago. So come on up, Janet. And she's gonna deliver her comments in Spanish. Uh, good morning, everyone, and I want to thank of course, uh, Phil, Carol, and Valerie for their ten tenacity and determination. And we needed that. We absolutely, uh, unfortunately, we say after all of those years of knowing the data, knowing the actors, and knowing what we were supposed to do, it hasn't happened. So. Um, I just want to say one more thing in English, which is that Latino communities also live with African Americans and that what people are not seeing is that one of every two children born in this country is a child of color. And that is key to what we're talking about the future. So. It is unconscionable for me to see that action hasn't been taken. Uh, y por eso también quiero decirles como inmigrantes, hablarles en español y decir que vivimos con los afroamericanos y que la industria está detrás de nosotros. 
Es más, 40% de las mujeres latinas fuman mentolados y el 60% de los jóvenes empiezan fumando mentolados. ¿Qué es lo que pasa? Este es un problema para las familias. Y cuando la madre fuma, ¿qué pasa? O el padre fuma, están más expuestos al humo de segunda mano. Eso es un problema que hace que nuestras comunidades mismas no se levanten. ¿Y qué está pasando con este asunto aquí en Estados Unidos? Estamos hablando que Estados Unidos va a Latinoamérica y dice, ustedes son unos corruptos, las, las, los gobiernos son corruptos, ¿cómo es posible que ustedes estén haciendo eso? Tenemos que ver aquí que en Estados Unidos hoy esta gente nos ha demostrado cómo es imposible decir que este gobierno es transparente. No es transparente porque está en las manos de la industria tabacalera y por estar en manos de la industria tabacalera, ¿qué es lo que pasa? No toman acción. ¿Cómo es posible que sigamos muriéndonos? culpa del mentol y que no pase nada. Así es que para mí, yo les quiero decir, tenemos que actuar. ¿Y cómo vamos a actuar? Educando a nuestras comunidades y decir que tabaco no es una cosa así que no tiene importancia. Y mata más gente que cualquier pistola que estamos viviendo. Segundo, que tenemos que organizar acciones en común con todos ellos y unirse a esta carta que se está escribiendo al presidente y decirle, bueno, tiene usted, ahora que ya va a salir, ha tenido el coraje y de sacar peticiones en favor de los inmigrantes y a la hora de las horas aquí estamos, que no tiene la fuerza moral para decir voy a pasar un executive order. Así que para mí hay que movilizar otras organizaciones, hay que movilizar a la comunidad y la verdad es que los medios de comunicación latinos tienen también que involucrarse al respecto porque en cada comunidad allí está la industria y tenemos que esta industria tabacalera no se puede robar nuestra salud. Con eso los dejo. Eh, muchas gracias. Ha sido un placer estar con ustedes. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Okay. Muchas gracias. Okay, our next and last speaker, and then we're going to take questions. I'll have a few comments after Michael Scott, but we're going to bring Michael Scott up. Um, and he is the network coordinator of NAPTIN, and NAPTIN has been um, a fighter and a force in over, you know, in the course of all of this, of this fight. And we are an affiliate of NAPTIN and, and we have been working very closely with them and we are proud to be an affiliate. Um, he has been involved in tobacco use and prevention and public health for the past 13 years. Prior to, to his position at NAPTIN, he served as health education specialist at both the Durham County Department of Public Health and Duke University Medical Center. Mr. Scott holds a BS degree in health education from North Carolina Central University and is a certified health education specialist. He is the proud father of two sons and one daughter. And Mr. Brittany Castain, who's a NAPTIN board member, I believe you're just going to come up and, and hold us back. So come on up. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, as Carol stated, I represent NAPTIN, the National African American Tobacco Prevention Network. Um, we're a national organization that promotes um, programs to benefit the health of um, people of African descent. Um, banning menthol has been on the forefront of, of our agenda since the Family Smoking and Tobacco Prevention Act was signed in 2009. Uh, and since that act was signed, um, the AATCLC has been leading the charge in this effort. And we'd just like to thank them for their commitment and their leadership in this arena. I'd also like to thank the previous speakers. Um, we've heard a lot of important, powerful information this, this morning. And um, a lot of the information that I'm going to talk about, we've, we've heard some. I'm just going to reiterate um, a lot of what we've already heard um, as it applies to the African American community. Banning menthol will save black lives. I mean, that's clear. Um, African Americans have indicated that they will quit using tobacco 
if menthol is banned. Secondly, um, banning menthol will reduce the initiation of youth smokers. We've heard that um, up here a couple of times already. Um, the 2012 Surgeon General's report provides a plethora of information of evidence to support that menthol is used to initiate youths into smoking and using tobacco. Banning menthol is the only action that causes concern for the tobacco industry. Um, and as we've heard about the, um, the, the, the law that was passed, um, the industry insisted that menthol not be included in that act. Why just menthol? Because we know menthol is included in over 90% of all tobacco products. Um, lastly, although there is ample scientific evidence to support banning menthol for health reasons, it should also be banned as a social justice reason. Uh, priority populations, as we've heard, have been systemically targeted with mentholated products for years, and too many lives have been lost as a result. So as a couple of the speakers before me have stated, the time for action is now. Thank you. All right, I have a few slides and a few comments, and then uh, Dr. Phil Gardner is going to come back up as well, and we'll, then we'll entertain some questions. So um, this is a film, a slide for a film, a movie called Addiction Incorporated, and it's an excellent film that documents how the tobacco industry researched how to make cigarettes more addictive. And when we think about addiction, uh, addiction is about chemistry, brain chemistry, and access to people. And the tobacco industry buys access to our children, to our people. And that is why we have such a problem with addiction. Um, this is part of, this is Chicago, their media, that the tobacco industry has branded us, big tobacco. They branded African Americans and other groups. Um, I want to introduce you to this little girl. Her name is Marie Evans. And she was given uh, free Newport cigarettes in Boston public housing at the age of nine. Dr. I mean, on the Honorable Joseph Califano, before the act was passed, he said that leaving menthol in would be relegating black children to the back of the public health bus. And so this is the child who is relegated to that, often the inner city child. This woman, she died. She was given free cigarettes. She was addicted at 13. She died at 54. And this woman, if she were alive, she'd be about my age now. So, and I feel like I have a lot of life left in me. Um, her family sued, and they actually were awarded a $152 million judgment, one of the, some of the few black people who received anything out of all this, out of the suits that are, have happened. So healthy communities facilitate the individual's ability to make healthy choices. We hear a lot of health information about um, individual things that you should do, which, you know, you should eat healthy, you should exercise, and all that is true. But it's also about your environment and the healthy community. The, the choice of making a healthy choice should be easy easier than making an unhealthy choice. And unfortunately, in our communities, it's a lot easier to make an unhealthy choice, and that is the norm. And that's what part of what we're, the work that Dr. Lisa Henriksen does is about changing the community, making our communities healthier, and making it easier to do those individual choices that increase health. Um, our children are in pain, so we don't do this work in a vacuum. We are African Americans, we're mothers, and we feel and we see the pain that our people are in. And so, but we still must continue. Um, there are many, um, there are some African American leadership groups that um, don't think that menthol should be prohibited. And they talk about uh, smuggling and criminalization. And so we want to really get ahead of that. We are not about criminalizing smokers. We want smokers to be supported. We want them to have resources. And we want them to have culturally appropriate and tailored uh, research. We've done work with our youth who smoke. And a lot of them, they smoke because of stress. They're self-medicating. And that's one of the ways that they do, they use to deal with their stress and their pain. So these are some of our children who've been murdered. Uh, when we were writing the letter for President Obama, we, it took us about two weeks because we kept having to change it because there were so many videos and murders that were coming out. So with that, this is part of our work as well, the targeting. Um, there we have Oscar Grant, who was murdered in Oakland by a BART police officer where we live. That's what we woke up to, woke up to on the January morning. Um, the middle child there is Trayvon Martin. And that picture was put out kind of to assassinate his character. Um, he was a beloved child with parents who loved him. And he was fooling around on Facebook or something with these pictures. And so that was the picture put out that he's, you know, a thug, 
which is the new word for you know what. Um, and then we have Michael Brown with the Ferguson. And so that change, what happened in Ferguson is changed public policy around taxing poor people for different things. These are some different issues. But this is all the climate that we're trying to do tobacco control in. And so when we go to our community and talk about cigarettes, it's easy to look at that and that we need to deal with that. And we do need to deal with that, but we also must deal with tobacco. So the tobacco industry targets everyone, but they are particularly pernicious in our community. Uh, we have so many other issues to deal with, and that tobacco gets pushed to the back burner. So doing nothing is not an option. Um, the, the, the talk of the criminalization and smuggling, the vast majority of African-American people are law-abiding people like everyone else. We have an element, of course, of violence. You hear about it, we live with it. But the vast majority of African-American people are law-abiding. If there are laws to protect them, they will respect them. It will, they will understand how serious it is. And then, just as everything else, we have to deal with um, the ramifications of public policy. So, and to give an example of having us uh, people at the tables, the state of California recently raised the age of smoking to 21. And so we uh, got with them and Chicago as well to take out the penalty for possession because you're raising it, you know, you're young adults. So we didn't want to have a police interaction about smoking cigarettes, but we do want the law raised. So doing nothing is not an option. We must do something and we must actively look at how this will affect our community and how we're going to implement it. And so um, smoking does not, uh, cigarettes, you know, that's not the issue with our people being killed. That's, it's other things. So tobacco is not a public health problem. It's a problem of political will. Everyone here has testified. We know the facts. We know the truth. And we need to act on them as adults. Uh, the tobacco industry sanctions, no matter what you hear, whether it was a master settlements agreement of $206 billion, whether it's uh, the Tobacco Control Act, they're always measured and they preserve the status quo. And usually the tobacco industry makes more profits. Uh, when, th when taxes go up, when things happen, it, they like stability. So when they know what the deal is, they can, they can work it out. So sanctions are not designed to stop the number one preventable cause of death because this is political suicide. So now that our president is outgoing, he has nothing to lose. Uh, we need him to take action for us, to stand with us, and to know that black, poor, and marginalized folks were often the public policy bargaining chip. Who will protect our children? Our children, they deserve protection from the police. They deserve protection from each other, from the world. And they deserve protection from the deadliest silent predator, the tobacco industry. These are our boys that we love. So what do we want for our children? And I'm going to have Dr. Phil come up. Look, thank, thank you, Carol. Um, she made a lot of the points I would have made. Um, it reflects what the, the um, African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council is about. Let me um, just thank everybody who came out here today, um, particularly our um, tobacco control advocates who stood up for us and spoke. Um, Carol makes no mistake about it that the social context that we find ourselves in with the um, tax on young African American men, let's be clear, black lives do matter. And as it's been pointed out, all lives matter. I want to do, in closing, a particular shout out to um, um, Valerie and Carol, for which this is not, would have not been possible. Um, they need and deserve all the recognition they get. I know I get a lot of acclaim, but I know where I come from, too. Let me also um, do a shout out to Amber um, um, Bullock, who's in the audience, who stood with us throughout this whole time at the Legacy Now Truth organization when it wasn't popular. This is also true of Laura Hamasaka, who was at the um, Legacy Foundation at that time. Um, I want to stress what Lisa said, what um, folks from Tobacco Free Kids said, what Carol said, and as a doctor of behavioral sciences, we don't need any more research on this topic. We need action. Thank you all. Um, so we have gone over if there are any burning questions we will entertain them otherwise we will let folks go we have some people and I want to recognize Shirley Riven Smith who's my sister with US Africa sister cities and a member of the NAACP here in Washington DC thank you for coming Shirley 
So do we have any questions or comments? Yeah, and so come up to the mic. Could someone assist her? It's easy to turn the mic on, but. If... And please say who you are. I will. Okay, thank you. First of all, good morning. I want to thank the African American Tobacco and Control Leadership Council for this press conference. I think it was um, very enlightening. Um, and I have to confess that I heard about this press conference from a colleague who works for a tobacco company. Um, I am Denise Rolark Barnes. I'm publisher of the Washington Informer newspaper, 52-year-old newspaper here in Washington, D.C. And I'm also chairperson of the National Newspaper Publishers Association. My president, uh, Dr. Ben Benjamin Chavis, is here as well. Um, I do have a question, and, but then I also want to uh, give an observation. Um, the question is, and, and I'm sure the research has showed this, but we talked about marketing of, of menthol. And as a young person who uh, started smoking at the age of 14 because my mother smoked, my father smoked, my stepmother smoked, uh, and who selected Salem cigarettes because that's what my mother smoked. It wasn't the advertising. It was f peers and family culture. That's what helped me to decide which brand to smoke. And I'm curious about you know, what influence that has uh, outside of the marketing. I'm proud to also say I no longer smoke, and I didn't do it for long, so. <laughs> um, but my concern is, um, as one who started working with my dad at the Washington Informer many years ago, uh, about 30 years ago now, uh, one of the mainstays of black newspapers was tobacco advertising. And when we learned that, um, um, one, about the harms of tobacco, we wrote, a, we wrote those stories. Um, when we realized that the tobacco advertising would be leaving us, I mean, we, there were conversations among our, among our NMPA members that a lot of our papers would go out of business. They didn't. Um, we also thought that on the flip side of that, that the advocates against tobacco would come to us to help us to promote their messages, mm -hmm. not only in, in uh, content and editorial, but also through advertising. Uh, we thought that would be replaced. It wasn't. Um, I remember having a conversation not long after the campaign for Tobacco Free Kids was started, asking them if they would consider running ads in our papers as they were running in the Washington Post and New York Times and others. We were told that our newspapers that represent, uh, we are 211 newspapers now, over print, uh, reaching about 20 million readers in m nearly 40 states, we were told that our publications would not be effective. Um, we are in the communities. Most of us, you will find this on streets like Martin Luther King Avenue or what have you. We're in the corridors. Um, I also uh, would like to say that during the litigation, the NMPA, in addition to NABOB, um, um, offered friend of the court briefs in those litigations. Uh, when a decision was made and the uh, decision as to where those, this advertising was, would go, no African-American newspapers no African-American-owned radio stations, nor TV stations, even though we don't really have that many, were included in the mandate for where those ad ads would go. So we had to go back and make sure that we were included. And lastly, I'm going to say that as I go back and look at these organizations that are here, and I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad you're concerned about the African-American community, but I, I look at your boards of directors. I look at the staffs that you have on your websites. I don't see a lot of people that look like me. So it concerns me that if we're really serious about this issue, we're going to do our part. You know, we want to make sure that we have healthy communities. And you said it very clearly. We believe Black Lives Matter, and it starts with us. But what is your role to make sure that we're included well, in the process, the funding comes to us, <laughs> and thank God for AATCLC. Yeah. Thank God you're here. I appreciate you. Thank you. Look, I, I want to thank you for being here, too. But I think um, truth needs to be told. Um, and I think it's, it's, it was a struggle, frankly, to get our um, mainstream tobacco control folks out for this, even. So your point is well taken. But they're out here. But let's be frank. Um, black, paper news, black newspapers have relied on tobacco industry funding for years. 
Um, they have refused to print stuff that has to do with the addictive nature of tobacco and its impact on African Americans. I don't want to sugarcoat this. Yes, there have been some newspapers that have stood up and do this. The majority haven't. The majority haven't. Let's, let's just be frank about that. I'm, I, I, I wish I wasn't the one saying this. I'm aware of the suit that was brought that African American newspapers were left out. In fact, they came to AATCLC and say, would you support us in going back to, to ensure that um, black papers got the same, um, for lack of a better term, reimbursement that these other newspapers did? Well, as bad as the New York Times is and as bad as the Washington Post is and as bad as the LA Times is, I know they, they want me to do this, it is important that we take a stand that we all, if, if black lives matter, then they matter in black print too. Okay, um, let me just say though, um, and I'm gonna let my sisters talk. Um, <laughs> I wanna thank you for being here and I, I would be open to um, us collaborating on getting health news about African Americans into black papers more often and, and, and ongoingly. Um, I, I, I say that sincerely and I say that honestly. Um, with that, I'll let... Um, these ladies talk. First, I want to say thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, I had a grant maybe 10 years ago with um, the American Legacy Foundation, the African American Media Advocacy Project, where I was trying to work with the NNPA papers I write as well. And um, we just want to say that we we see your struggles, and so and we know you know the Freedom's Journal. Our black papers were created to obtain our freedom, and and a black paper in the old days would pass hands fifty times because people couldn't afford it, and people read it to each other. So I know the importance of our black media, and that we need our own independent media more and more. And as things are changing, it's harder for everybody. So we need our media to tell the truth and to. Um, to report scientific information. Many times I write the articles to send out. I'm thankful today I don't have to do that because we have real journalists here, real media here. So it's an issue and that we are fighting to get funding for our media. And so, and the, and the other thing is this, the other piece is that because our elected officials oftentimes are taking the tobacco industry money, they're not fighting for us. So there's no pressure on the, on, on the, on the public health entities to, you know, you know how things work. They don't work the way that we think they do oftentimes. So there's little pressure from our elected officials about what is happening with the messaging for our people. And people who read black papers, they vote. Those are our, those are our voters for sure, you know. And so we, we would love to work with you more. We would love to sit down with some of, the, some of the media buys and to have the good information coming to our papers. There was a time when it was only alcohol and tobacco that would, would wanted to be associated with us. And so it's a new day, and there are many, we're consumers, and so the things that we consume, they need to be advertising in our papers that, that aren't killing us. We have a comment from, okay. Yes, please. Thank you, my name is Jim Curry. I direct an organization that represents the officers in the US Public Health Service. More critically, I am a retired Army colonel and one group that's not been mentioned here today is people in our military. Uh, two years ago, the Secretary of the Navy proposed informally that military exchanges and commissaries quit selling tobacco products. The reaction to that was a congressman from California named Duncan Hunter who got an amendment onto the National Defense Authorization Act prohibiting the Defense Department from ending the sale of those tobacco products in uh, military commissaries and, and uh, uh, exchanges. Uh, we helped put together a coalition, including the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, that went to the Senate side, because this bill was passed on the House, that went to the Senate side and tried to urge the Senate not to go along with that prohibition. And we were doing so well when we were in one meeting with a Republican senator, um, they said, uh, you're scaring the crap, although he didn't use the word crap, he used something else. You're scaring the crap out of big tobacco, and they're following after you, twisting arms and giving out money. That's the problem. They have an unlimited amount of money, and the thing that affects politicians, almost every one of them, is either votes or money. And if we can't get people to care about things like tobacco control, it's not gonna happen. 
That's the reality of it. And that's why you've got people at OMB stopping things, and it's the reason why you have delays of one kind or another. I can assure you there are people putting political pressure on these folks and saying, oh, we might lose North Carolina if you do that, or we might lose Kentucky if you do that, or whatever it happens to be. We have to be stronger than that, and we have to care more than they do, and we have to outwork them. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. Thank you. Yes. Just if you're if you want to speak, just come up to the mic, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Laurent Hubert, and I'm with Action on Smoking and Health and the Firma Convention Alliance. It's a global alliance of NGOs that work on the Tobacco Treaty. And there's something I wanted to mention because it hasn't been mentioned here today, and something that really supports the uh, call on President Obama and the FDA to to, to uh, ban um, uh, menthol from from cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And so there's four international instruments, and obviously the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which the U.S. has signed but not yet ratified, but it's Article 11 very clearly asked for eliminating um, menthol from, uh, from tobacco products. Then there's the Global Action Plan on Non-Criticable Diseases, which came out after the uh, U.N. high-level meeting on NCDs and the political declaration, which has the target of 30 percent reduction in tobacco use. If the African-American community is to reduce its cons tobacco consumption by 30%, it has to, obviously, the U.S. has to ban the sales of uh, menthol products. Then also the United, um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which President Obama has committed the United States to achieve those goals. And they call on implementation of the FCTC and also achieve reduction in tobacco use. So again, if you want to have our uh, most vulnerable populations achieve those goals, we have to ban menthol. And lastly, there's also the, um, the treaty against um, racial discrimination, which the United States has ratified. And then here again, I think there's a strong claim that can be made that menthol really goes, uh, the, and the use of menthol in cigarettes really goes against the uh, spirit of this treaty. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And we've, we've, there's never been a remedy discussed that would, that would specifically benefit African Americans in all that we've been through. There, there's been very little that that's talks about giving us restu restitution for, for, for the harm that's been done to our community over all these decades. And so when things happen, when things are negotiated, we're, we are the afterthought. And we, you know, whether it's newspaper buys or public health policy, if, you know, we, we're here by sheer tenacity, I can tell you that. <laughs> it's sheer tenacity in dealing with our own people and in dealing with the government. Can I, can I, Go I let me just say one thing. Um, here it's I, I want to thank, um, I, didn't I did recognize him, but I didn't recognize him, um, Dr. Ben Chavis being in the room. Um, he came in and he waved at me, and I waved him, and I looked, and I went, that's Dr. Ben Chavis. <laughs> and I said, well, I couldn't, who wouldn't, who would, why would he come to my press conference? I'm sitting here with my tennis shoes on. I mean, he's, here's somebody who's actually done something in his life. Um, so I want to thank you um, for coming out. Um, I want to, if anything that you can do to help us in um, building support with other African American organizations, um, we'd, we'd, we'd love for you. Please come to the mic, sir. Um. Thank you very much, and I'll be very brief. Um, I'm so proud that our chairman of our organization is Denise Warlock Barnes. You should know that many of our African American owned newspapers are owned by sisters, owned by who are second and third generation. And I, I would say today publicly that the NMPA wants to work with you directly. We will help raise public awareness around this issue. But I also know that this criminalization issue is also uh, tearing at us because in Michael Brown's case and Eric Garner's case, it was all involving cigarettes. Uh, Eric Garner was choked to death in New York because the police thought he was had uh, selling cigarettes illegally. And, and I think that um, we have to work together so we don't get divided on this issue. Yeah. Um, before I started working in the civil rights movement, I was a chemist. And I know that uh, the science, well, we, don't, we don't distribute enough of the scientific information to our community. We need more. And we want to help you on a regular basis. So our pledge to real work. And I think this press conference ought to be full of people. I mean, the, the data that you gave out, the information you gave, gave out, millions of our people should get that information. 
And I think there are ways that we can help, particularly with social media. Last point with millennials. Young people today are making choices earlier than when we made choices. Mm -hmm. And they're impacted true. by the information that they get. And I strongly want to recommend uh, to your council that we also have a component utilizing social media uh, to get the word out about uh, the dangers of uh, all cigarettes as well as menthol uh, to our community because our young minds are very susceptible earlier uh, than you would even think about how they make choices in life. So we would like to work with you. And well, thank you for this. No, call. thank you. Um, we're definitely going to. I, I know you are, and I'm going to let you end it. We're going to definitely take you up on this offer. Um, the criminalization part, I guess Carol raised it earlier, we need to be straight up about it. The National Organization of Black Law Enforcement are the ones who put this forward. We have fought hard in all things that we've put forward not to criminalize this issue. So we're clear on that. We're, we're steadfast and we're clear on that. We don't, I think the killing of Eric um, Garner and um, the other brother Brown um, is a reflection of a larger problem in America having to do with police brutality toward the black community. Um, and we need to stand against that also. Um, with having said that, let me give this back to Carol to make some closing remarks, and then we should let folks get okay, out here. Okay. We appreciate you hanging with us. And I, so I want to say, before we had the incident in Baton Rouge, I do presentations all over the country. And I, you know, I would talk about Eric Gardner because it wasn't the Lucy's. It was, it's the system and it's police brutality. And unfortunately, we had that demonstrated with the brother in Baton Rouge who was killed and he was selling DVDs or CDs to support his family with the permission of the store owner. So that's a, so it's an example of that, that it, that's not what it's about. It's not about cigarettes, somebody selling Lucy's that they're murdered or killed by the police. They're, it's about police brutality. It's about changing that culture. And certainly we have to do that. And we are, we want, you know, we cry and we, you know, we, it's, we're dealing with this in, comprehensively. So it's not just cigarettes over here. Don't do that. It's, it's a big issue and we need to start um, pulling it apart. To telling the truth, facing the truth, and acting on the truth. And so we are happy to stand with you, and we're also happy to put pressure on some of the entities that we are colleagues with to support you and to, to give our people information the same as everyone else. So thank you all for coming. And we have about two or 300 people who are watching this online. It will be archived. Our website is savingblacklives.org. And this, the archive will be up very shortly. And so there, you're with, you're amongst a much bigger audience. But we want to get, we want to get the word out much broader and much broader to our own people. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.